All right, everybody, welcome back live at Truth Us, another edition. Hope everybody is doing well as we kind of go through this, uh, I don't know, these weird COVID numbers that are coming back around. Nobody likes to see that, but uh, I don't know, things have kind of been trending nationwide in a bad direction, and you're starting to see some local places uh, say you got to be vaccinated, which I think is good, but the masks are coming back, and uh, I don't know. Let's hope we don't go down this bad uh, rabbit hole. As my guest and I were just talking about off the air, Dean Johnson, we bring in, longtime music critic from The Globe and The Herald. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Always good to be with you, Drew. How are you today? I'm doing well. So, yeah, kind of a weird time. Hope, how's everybody doing? Healthy still, or... Uh, as far as we know, yeah, you know, we're taking, everybody's taking this all day by day. So, uh, so far, so good. It is. It is. It is a little bit scary. It's, it's weird. It's like the kind of the worlds are colliding because we're, we were coming out of this thing and now things have kind of turned in kind of a bad direction again. But, but a lot of the good stuff is still happening. We got Billy Joel tonight at Fenway Park. We had Guns N' Roses last night. Uh, I don't know. Would you be safe going to a concert right now? What's your feeling? You know, I'm in a different situation being a, a bit older, though, you know, though I am vaxxed. Uh, but I, if it was outdoors, maybe. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going down to see Billy Joel right now. I'm taking this case by case because mm -hmm. things are changing by the moment. Yeah. In a funny sort of way, the Fenway concerts uh, may just be, uh, in a manner of speaking, a musical test tube for the rest of the country. Uh, and we'll have to see what happens with what happened at Lollapalooza. If, if there's going to be an outbreak over there after what, how, how many, what, 300,000 that showed up and changed for Lollapalooza. Yep. But so far, the powers that be have not said, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. So let's, uh, let's do this while we can, because maybe in a month or so, they're going to say exactly that. Yeah, so here we are. Yeah, I heard Garth Brooks today he was just talking about uh, Garth is very cautious, as, as we know, and he uh, said they're definitely going to reevaluate their fall shows that they have planned. One of them's at Gillette in October, I think. Yeah, well, it, because as we were saying, things seem to be changing by the moment, but it may well be that this new wave peaks around September or October or not. <laughs> Who knows, right? You know, or, or not. So that's, that's, that's a funny thing. It's kind of like, well, if, uh, if nothing else happens, and something else always seems to happen. But for the time being, hey, uh, the green light is on for the concerts at Fenway Park. Let's People need to blow off a little steam, I think. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, blow off a little steam. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Billy Joel, first of all. Yeah, he's a man that uh, you've had the chance to cover, and uh, I think, did you say you met him at one point, right? We used to, the way things used to work at the Herald and the Globe, particularly during my time at the Herald, is you would usually talk to them on the phone ahead of time. So I don't know, I don't think I ever got a chance to meet him per se, but we had a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, on the phone over the years. That must be pretty he fun. Was, he was one of those guys I never really had been into. My wife had been in to Billy Joel and his music. So because of her, we would go to shows and I would listen and the like. And, and I began to uh, respect to what, what he uh, was doing as an artist and the like. Great conversations. Um, I always used to say he's he's got sort of a, a, a punky attitude, not punk clash uh, sex pistols, but, uh, you know, a guy who came out of New York, one of those guys. New York toughness. Yeah, yeah. So he, he was fun to talk to. And uh, one of the things that I, I remember in our conversations was years and years ago when we were talking about uh, continuing to do live concerts as he was getting older, like, I remember him saying the legs go first. <laughs> so I don't know if he still feels that way or not. And we'll see how, how, how much... Uh, uh, running around he does on stage but he's um, he's been a, a a complicated and maybe confounding figure for a lot of the fans because I think it's been what decades since he's made any new music yeah doesn't feel he's got any in him but is happy to so so that's the the downside the the, the upside is he, he's happy to continue to tour and, you know, please his fans. And, you know, by the same token, he's well, uh, well, well rewarded financially for that. Uh, to continue, he's got an enormous, uh, you know, songbook to draw from, that's for sure. It is. It, you know, that's, I guess that's why, because when I was, I guess when I fell into him, I don't know, whenever that was for me, maybe high school age or just out, um, yeah, I have not been back. I mean, I went to a few shows when I was really into him, but I haven't even seen him at any of these Fenway shows that he's kind of made an annual yeah. thing because it's just, uh, if there's no nothing new, no new music for me, I'm not really drawn to artists. I like to see them keep progressing. Um, 
you know, which is why I'll go to, you know, I think we've talked about this before. I'll go to a Springsteen show any days because it's always it's something new, you know. Um, but with Billy Joel, there hasn't been. But th- that being said, he's kind of, you mentioned touring, but the touring is kind of unique too because he has these like, you know, monthly shows at Madison Square Garden and, you know, he does the annual stint at Fenway. It's almost like the people kind of come to him too. It's not, some, it's not like he's bouncing around all over the country, right? No, no, he's not. Uh, he's not going to suddenly go the 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 Des Moines, um, Billings, <laughs> Montana, uh, Kansas City route. He right. knows where his strengths are. He knows where his fans are, and it is sort of funny that I, I dare say that probably outside of New York, Boston is, is his best market. Now, the only time I've seen him in a, in a um, stadium setting is when he performed with Elton John, I think, down at uh, at uh, Sullivan Stadium, as we might have called it then. So I haven't seen him doing any of these Fenway shows uh, either, but there's the constant demand i will be stunned i'm not i can't remember if this is sold out or not but i will be stunned if by showtime it has not because the people who like billy Joel really really do like him yeah he puts on a good show get to sing along right yeah what i've always uh, found interesting is he's uh isn't afraid to hang his influences on his sleeve as it were and some of the discussions uh, i've had with him over the years uh, you know, Baby Grand was a, a, an extremely um, outright tribute to Ray Charles. But some of the other songs that he's done over the years, I don't think people know that much about it. There's a song called Shades of Grey, for example, that was on one of his later albums. And he said that, that, that was his tribute to Cream. And you go back and listen to that now and you say, son of a gun, it is very much a tribute to Cream. Another song I think is uh, Getting Better. I may get the title just right, Getting He's owed to the uh, English band Traffic, and he and he plays Hammond organ on it, and he's pretty good at that. And he, you know, typical Billy Joel says, "I'm a real good Hammond organ player." You know, you never hear me play. I always play the piano, but I can play Hammond organ almost as well as anybody. And you go, "Oh yeah, Billy." But you listen to that song, you say, "Yep, he can do that." Yeah, he's, he was big Beatles too, right? Yeah, that was the, the heroes for him, right? Wasn't he a big Beatles guy? Oh, uh, absolutely. I think like uh, like so many from that era were, were the Beatles. The, uh, and that's where it all began, I think, for so many of them with the Beatles. Yeah, who wasn't a big Beatles uh, guy or woman? I, that, that, that seems to be, they, they influenced everybody, right? If I had been given $5 during my time at the Herald and at the Globe for every time someone told me it was the Beatles and the Beatles changed everything, uh, I would continue to be a rich man today. So it does happen and it continues to happen. Uh, even now, I read influences, I read interviews, and I say, oh, the Beatles. And if they didn't see the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, then it was the Beatles album that started it all for them. So it continues to be the case, and certainly with Billy Joel. Absolutely. What's the, uh, we got some rain coming in for Billy tonight. What's a, it brings up an interesting topic. What's your favorite weather show you've ever seen in your life? You mean in terms of bad weather? Yeah, tough elements or... Um, either Woodstock 94 or 99. I had to cover both of those. Wow. And uh, the weather was absolutely a factor in both of them. You know, um, between the mud and the rain and, and, and the like. Uh, we used to joke sometimes when we'd all get together as writers at uh, what used to be called Great Woods, you know, if we'd start off with a weather lead, as it were, we talked about the weather early on. And that means we really didn't come up with a better idea for a lead because that was such an obvious way to do it. But yeah, if it's boring cats and dogs, and all of a sudden, those those row two seats in the outfield aren't as good as those seats maybe uh, underneath the, the 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 stadium, but they'll figure it out. You know, people know it's coming. They'll have the the uh, the, the umbrellas and everything else. I don't think I realized you were covering Woodstock '99 because that's the uh, there's a big documentary that's uh, it's either out or just about out. I, I yeah. I think it just came out, right? Yeah. Um, I've heard it's a, I've heard it's a good one to see. A lot of people are referring to that as the day the '90s died. What was that like? There were so many things wrong with that from the beginning, uh, and the from what I've read of the reviews, the uh, the documentary covers most of it well. There's only one thing that I I, I would take issue with that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but. Um, the same people who did the other Woodstocks and they get burned by the fences being torn down and making it free events. So uh, people may have seen the shorthand here. It was done on an, an old military base and very fenced off. So you weren't going to be able to get in free. You had to really go in for all three days. I did not as a member of the press. At that point, I told my boss, I said, listen, I, I'm not camping out. 
you know, if I can go up there and I found a nice little B&B, thank you very much, where I could retreat to for uh, some sanity to the end of the night. But it was just extraordinarily hot. And what everyone seems to know, if you know nothing else about it, and it's true, is back in the, the, the bottled water was going for $4 a bottle. And they supposedly had hoses and free water. I never saw any, any there. So right away, they uh, went to great lengths to kind of like get the masses angry, so to speak. And, you know, they had a lot of different events and different things that had gone on at that point. And, uh, well, we'll see what's going what's gonna to happen with it all. But boy, oh boy, did they, um, did they just uh, planned it horribly in some of the acts that they had and how they grouped some of the people and the like. Um, I think the people there felt that they were being taken the prices for pizzas and sandwiches and things were outrageous for that time time of year and it just built the anger um and we began to see it you could tell people were getting uh, grouchy and angry and, and they're talking about you know the 90s meals and the, the misogyny and that which might have been a factor to to me what i still remember is that um it, it uh it came down to fred durst i think he was the one that really got everyone doing you know you, you could feel the uh, the bad energy Sunday night. He came out and did break stuff and really got the crowd extraordinarily riled up. And that's when things started to break through. I, I thought actually Metallica and Rage Against the Machine and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, I thought were very mature actually about trying to keep everyone in control because they could have just made the place explode and they kind of knew. And so they kind of held back, although they gave, gave great sets. What they're saying now in the documentary is that um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers really um, made things go off when they did uh, Jimi Hendrix's, a cover of Jimi Hendrix's Fire. And that's when people started torching everything. Mm -hmm. What I remember is everything was already torched. And I think these guys not understanding what it was in a moment of, of what they thought would be comedy and maybe some uh, comic relief to calm things down broke into the song somewhat spontaneously. It was already mm -hmm. happening. I don't think they did that because the rest of this set was not one that was trying to drive people out of their minds. But man, it was ugly. At that point, as the fire started breaking out everywhere, I said, okay, we're going to the press area, which was secure, and we'll take it from there. So you actually kind of uh, you got on the dock. You, you could tell it was gonna get ugly real fast. It was ugly by the time that we left. I mean, I stayed for most of the Red Hot Chili Pepper set, if not all of it. And even then, the fires are being set. It was, it, you, you, you're, you're approaching Lord of the Flies territory, I am not a combat correspondent. I'm a music writer. So I said, okay, that's good enough. I can go back to the press tent and get everything secondhand and we'll figure it out from there. Wow, that is fascinating. So you you have, you have definitely though, clear bullseye on Fred Durst for that night. That was, that was a, uh, you felt it kind of building up and he took advantage of it essentially? Fred Durst is a jackass. <laughs> There's no other way about it. I think he knew exactly what he was doing and thought he could have his Woodstock moment. Well, he did. <clears throat> you know, and I, and I just saw it, saw it all going on, and that, that's when people started tearing or uh, tearing off plywood, uh, uh, you know, plywood walls and uh, uh, surfing on them. And he's just encouraging everyone to just—he was just whipping everyone up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I absolutely. Well, it was not going well, and maybe it would have happened without him. But I absolutely put it all at his feet, no question, from my perspective, and I was there. Must have been must have been scary. I was twelve watching that, and I remember thinking those are kind of scenes I hadn't really seen before as a you know young boy uh, back in 1999. And that must have been pretty scary to be there. Well, you know there were different stages, and there was uh, far apart, and <clears throat> and you you got a sense that um, people were disgruntled because of the way they had been treated. You know they basically were caged in and forced to pay outrageous rates for things. And I don't know what people did if they didn't bring enough money. Um, you know, the porta potties did not serve their purposes very well at all. I take it they weren't swiping credit cards at the stands and stuff in those days, right? They had some, I think some of them did, uh, did do credit cards. You know, you could take them and do some swiping of them, but how many thought that they would need them? I don't think anyone thought you'd have to pay $4 a Four dollars a bottle for water. I mean, I brought a thermometer with me, and at one point I, I put it down on the tower of the pavement of the uh, of this base. Again, it was an ex-military base, and it just went right off uh, the top of the. Uh, it didn't break, but it went as high as it could go. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 120 degrees. That's the surface. So it, it was brutally warm. It really, really was. Um, 
maybe they are, maybe the way they arranged the acts uh, didn't help. It probably could have been a, a little differently done. But uh, it, it started really getting uh, ugly early on. And I think it was like they're telling, telling Cheryl Crow and uh, a couple of the other artists, I think even a couple of the, the actresses who showed up to deduce people, you know, they're screaming, take your tops off, take their tops off. And that's not the, the spirit of what was done. Was there ever a good spirit there at the beginning? Did it feel like this could be, uh, you know, a, a good... There were some fun moments. I mean, I, I remember Willie Nelson being there and, and, and doing some, some great stuff. And uh, uh, some of the other artists that showed up was that the, uh, they weren't well received. It was the tragically hip, I think, the Canadian. Yeah, the huge in Canada. Uh, you know, nice set. Um, there were moments. And, and, and there were good moments because they did have a wild variety of, of acts there. But, um, you know, the, the, I, I think you have to say the, the greed and, um, you know, the, the, the misogyny eventually began to just catch up with things. You know, one of my favorite uh, original Woodstock favorite stories, have you ever heard the story of the, with the pilot who flew? Joe Cocker was like touring across the country somewhere. And he was leaving his band to make a Woodstock appearance. And I, I think I got all the details right here. But long story short, he's being helicoptered into Woodstock. And the, uh, he has no idea how big this has gotten, the original. And uh, he sees this massive sea of people as they come over. And he goes, what in the world is that? And the pilot says, that, my friend, would be your audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones. You got a favorite original story or original Woodstock? At one point, uh, when it was maybe the 15th anniversary, I can't remember offhand, we, I, I got in touch with a lot of the artists from the original Woodstock to, to get the stories and like, and I, I forget which one of the artists, it's a little helicopter story. Between nerves and fright and height and everything else, one of the artists um, threw up all over the Woodstock audience as they were helicoptering over them. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of them that, that, that I remember, but... Uh, one of the stories, uh, of course, uh, one of the, uh, le le the legendary sets there had been from Santana. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's, who's seen the movie, uh, you know, the drummer Michael Shreve particularly seemed to have an almost out-of-body experience. Talk about peaking at exactly the right time in your life. It, it's extraordinary down to this day. But um, uh, Carlos had, had told me that he had, um, they had been told, oh, you're not going to go out for another three or four hours. Don't worry about it. So knowing that, and with everything going on there, he immediately took a hit of, and I, it was not acid, I can't remember what it was, but he maybe might have even been acid. He took a hit of something, and they immediately said, you're on now, you're on now, you're on now. So he went out there clearly dosed, and he said, I, I, I just went through most of the set praying that I would be in the right key and in the right time signature for the whole set. But it worked. Amazing. I, I had heard that story. That is fascinating, man. It, it worked. What uh, uh, you mentioned Willie Nelson a moment ago. Explain to me this. So the uh, obviously he's done such great work with that Farm Aid concert that's just become a uh, a staple here over the last few decades. And uh, coming back to Hartford after just being there a couple of years ago, um, what is it about Hartford? I thought that was kind of an odd move. Well, again, I'll compare that to I remember talking to years ago to Lou Reed who was doing a Farm Aid, one of the Farm Aid benefits. And I kind of said. Hey, heck, are you doing doing a farm aid benefit? And he said, "I spent a lot of my life in New Jersey. There are a lot of farms we should get in the western part of New Jersey, and I think there are parts of Connecticut that still continue to be farmland. And I think what Nelson has done over the years is is hold the benefit first in places where it makes sense, and then maybe in various parts of the country to emphasize the fact that there are farmers everywhere." Yeah. that are having difficulty. I, I don't know that for certainty, but I probably is a combination of that. There is, a, you know, that, that, uh, there are parts of Connecticut where uh, there's a lot of, farm, and, and uh, as I believe, a lot of vineyards, although I don't think that quite qualifies as farm aid. He pointed that, uh, he pointed that out, actually. He said that's the, uh, New England is host, I forget the percentage, but New England is host of uh, whatever percentage of farms in this country, and it is a, it's a big number, you're right. Um, he said yeah. New England, New York, New Jersey, it's a bit, it's, and I think people sometimes just picture it, you know, Midwest, that's where the, the farm yeah. is, but no, that's not the case. Now, now, right or wrong, we'll see if this is true, but I remember reading somewhere fairly recently, if the, uh, uh, the world warming continues, if climate change continues, that in 10 to 15 years, that Southern New England will be the prime 
uh, uh, wine country in the area because Napa and everything else will get too hot. Wow. So if it continues, why we, we, we may be in the number one wine growing area in the United States. Wow. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Interesting, but also scary at the same and, time. Yeah, course. yeah, it's a combination of the two. Talk about good news, bad news. Dean Johnson joining us, a longtime music critic for the Globe, for the Herald. Um, He's a fascinating guy too, isn't he? Willie Nelson, I I I love watching him. I mean, I I still think he's great. I mean, he just he's he's with it. I kind of take all these days, uh, don't take them for granted, right? I, I saw him a number of times when I was covering, you know, music on a daily basis, and when it ended up doing well at the Herald during high season, maybe four or five concerts a week that we would do. And it took me a while to get into it, um, but he is, you know, he's he's carved out his own unique place in, in the music world. But what always fascinated me, and I saw this particularly at Woodstock 99, it stuck with me, I, I, although I already knew it. Um, he's a great lead guitarist. Yeah. He's got that whole battered, beaten up acoustic guitar he uses, but he can play these crazed Mexicali uh, runs on them. And besides being a, a songwriter and a singer, he, given uh, his moments, is a great guitarist, even when it comes to you know laying down the memorable solo or the like. He just doesn't need to show it off very much. Kind of reminds me of James Taylor a little bit. Sometimes you you write him up as a you know kind of a chordsy guitar player, but if you pay attention to James Taylor, he's he's picking all around like uh, he's kind of a great little player himself. Uh, um, I once had the opportunity to sit in a room, you know, maybe about the size of your kitchen, as I see behind you while he was doing a solo live concert on one of the radio stations in Boston. So uh, I, you, you, I couldn't get much closer. I was close enough to have infected him if, uh, if it was this day and age. Um, and the tone he got from the guitar was, uh, the tone he got from the guitar was just something I never forgot. Really? Yeah, just, just remarkable. Are those two That's of the nicer, nicer guys in the, the music business right there? They seem to be I seem to get that feeling. Sometimes you can tell how other artists treat other artists, and you can tell those are the guys that are really the good ones too, especially the younger ones. It seems like it seems like Willie Nelson and James Taylor kind of uh, do do good by the young generation. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, I never hear complaints. Yeah, you never hear people say, "Ooh, I get burned." That they seem to be willing to uh, share the stage, share some advice, whatever the case might be, with with the two of them. And of course, you know, Willie feels he's. I think he feels he wants to. Get the younger generation in fine shape for the for the future as well too, you know. Absolutely. Who is the best and worst for you personally? Has that changed at all over the years? Or uh, best? I'm interview? sorry. The best. Best interview. Worst interview. Oh boy. Um, when I talk about the worst interviews, there are a couple that 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 come. Well, three that come to mind for different reasons. I did something with Sting once. Yeah, I remember you telling me this. You didn't like Sting, did you? You know, he was doing it for a movie, uh, Brimstone and Treckle, I guess, a dreadful movie you never hear much about. I think it was his first foray in, in, into film. So he wasn't doing the music press, he was doing that. And I, he just seemed to have enjoyed torturing people during this. Yeah. You know, difficult answers, monosyllabic answers and, and the like. Um, so, and, and I'm sure he mellowed and changed after that, but that one was not pleasant. I got enough for some good stories I was able to sell to a number of people, but phew, that was tough. Uh, another one for a completely different version is Twyla Thought, the famed choreographer. I don't know why I get sent to talk to her, but she doesn't suffer fools gladly. What do I know about contemporary dance? You know, so you try to find that middle ground, and it was it was difficult. It was it was it was pulling teeth. But the, I think maybe as soon as we finish, I'll think of a worst one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Dennis Miller, remember he had a talk show for a while. Yeah, and it bombed immediately. And that was the only time that I can remember that I almost said, you know what, this isn't good for either of us. Let's just shut this down. That was the only time I almost just cut it short and say, don't bother, because he was, uh, you know, he was cynical and acerbic, and you know, refused to accept any kind of responsibility for what had gone on there, and was just, a, uh, just not a pleasant guy all around. I have no desire. You know, the other, Twyla Tharp, Sting, sure, I'd give him a go. Dennis, I have no desire to, ever to talk to Dennis Miller again. I feel, like that, I feel like that kind of attitude hurt him in his professional life. I mean, you think about the Monday night football thing that he was kind of gifted and that didn't last long. And a lot of those jobs were kind of quick and that's probably why. And what, it's never his fault. Yeah, on the on the best side, who's the who's the guy you just had great chemistry with though? Or, or woman for that matter? Um, 
Peter Townsend. Townsend. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be great chemistry. He just, uh, you just give him the topic and he will argue with himself during the course of the conversation uh, because he is so thoughtful and, and like a lot of rockers, you know, just not it's a little off point, which is sometimes what you want with, with, with your artists of any field as well too. But I only spoke with him once and it was in a trailer, again, down at Sullivan Stadium and, and for any great length of time. And I almost, I almost just had to turn on the, the, the recorder and say, how you doing, Pete? I think I asked a few questions and he just went with it and ran with it. So I, I if someone has a chance to sit down as a, as a journalist with, uh, Town, with Townsend for any great length of time and can't come away with a great interview, man, yeah. hang it up. Is that, because um, a lot of musicians, especially back in when the your, your day of covering all that stuff, newspaper writers were kind of, uh, sometimes rockers would look at you and be a little bit skeptical because, you know, what are you going to write about me? I'm not going to open up too much here, right? Uh, there was that, and there was some kind of um, camaraderie as well as, well, you know, either, either way. You had that or you say, well, you know, you're trying to get word out, so we're sort of on the same team here. You never knew. Yeah, uh, it all depends. I think how badly an artist might have gotten uh, gotten burned in the past. Now that has all changed, and because of the the multiple media platforms available to artists, you, you if it's an artist that's fairly popular, you you can't get them out of the the spotlight, no matter how much you may want to. Yeah. You know? So um, uh, that that's that's one of the interesting trends I see over the years. Now these artists, how do I put it? They're all very much a part of the culture and the machine. And if you would, during the 60s and 70s, and maybe even during the 80s, they were kind of like outside of it, looking at it a little askance. Mm -hmm. I don't think that happens much anymore. Did you ever write something critical where somebody came back at you the next time around and said, what the hell was that all about? I did an Almond Brothers review where uh, I think Jamo, one of the drummers, actually uh, made a copy of my review and uh, in, in marginal notes put in all the thoughts that he thought. And it was, wasn't was facetious or sarcastic, put in all the thoughts that he thought I had missed or needed to correct on and sent me the review back, uh, sent her a copy of it back like that. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was during the time when they were trying to go through various guitarists because Dickie Betts was having problems before they finally just uh, dumped them all together. and. Um, the, oh, Jack, uh, I can't remember Jack's last name. The guitarist that they had filling in for him that night was a great guy, but was not one of those explosive improvisational kind of guys like Haynes and Dickie Betts and, and like uh, Dwayne Allman. I just thought the show didn't quite have the wings that it usually uh, should have. But uh, he very uh, scholarly uh, took a copy of my review and put in marginal notes and uh, things I might have missed or might not have known and in, in the like. So uh, it's okay. I respect that. It's kind of flattering in a way, right? He gave you the time of day and he gave it back to you? I think so. Boston was always a very important uh, market for the Almonds. That might have been part of it too. I think it was one of their key markets. So their manager was from here originally, and I think Bar Boston was one of the first markets to take to them. So I think that's kind of it, too. What do you do when you get something like that? Do you uh, do you do you write it again in the paper and say that, that, that I don't know what? It, how does that work? What did you frame it? I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, I, I still have a copy of it somewhere, I think, and it it was nice to see. But you know, you know, yeah, I I, I wasn't going to you know run that and get into a, a hissing contest with him about it. He he did it. In fact, it needed to be said. Fair thoughts, fair points. I, I don't think he brought up anything that made me say. Oh boy, I, I just really missed that. But you know, that's that's the beauty of music. It hits people in different ways. Uh, they were looking for something perhaps a little bit different. I I had seen the Elman Brothers a lot of times like that. I mean, I, I'd seen the original lineup, so I kind of knew, you know, uh, what the good should be when they when they were alive. And it wasn't quite that way. And sure enough, he just did a gig or two with them and moved on. Although I think he continues to be friends and records them privately. Absolutely. Um, we talked all about Billy Joel at the beginning of this. Guns N' Roses was, of course, at the uh, Fenway Park last night. I don't know. For me, I a lot of those 80s bands, that kind of uh, sound doesn't do it for me. I know there's some I know there's some stuff there, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's because I was bored in the late 80s. I kind of missed it. I don't know what it is, but that that sound doesn't quite do it for me. What am I missing about Guns N' Roses? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
there's some bands and some music that just are, are intergenerational. But I, I think Guns N' Roses, for whatever reasons, are, as you said, a band of the moment, for the moment, for a particular generation. And I'm not sure the generations that came before or after them are really going to take to the band. As say someone like, we'll use the, the, the obvious example, someone like the Beatles or, or, or the Allman Brothers would. Um, Slash is a great guitarist. They've certainly got uh, their list of songs that people are going to, to, to be mindful with for a while. But um, it's uh, not um, something that I play for personal pleasure. Yeah. Um, it, there's a, um, it's part of rock and roll in general, so I, I don't know why I, I'm picking four of Guns N' Roses out over this. There's a Peter Panish quality to the band that I somehow... Um, doesn't sit with me. They, they're just not grown up. Yeah. They just won't grow up. Isn't that how the song where they won't grow up? Yeah. And some somehow you like to see a little strength of maturity. Yeah. That whole artist progression thing we talked about. We came full circle yeah. with this conversation. Yeah. But you know that's the beauty of music. There are a lot of people who say this is these are the only guys I need, and they're going to be down there and will continue to be there every time they show up. I know. Uh, I think I'll end with this. We have uh, the. We talked about COVID at the beginning of this, and it seems to be coming back around a little bit. I just saw our friends over at Club Passim in Cambridge are uh, going to require vaccine cards now to get in, along with masks. I think maybe we might be seeing a lot more of that at venues if we can get off with shows in the fall. Hopefully, we can. But uh, it seems like that will be the way of the world. Are you worried about music as we go late summer, fall, or what? Absolutely, because we just don't know. I will say, um, at least in my mind. I don't think there's uh, another portion. Everybody in the music industry was devastated by this. Clearly, everyone was. But I don't think anyone took the hit as much as, dare I say it, the boomers, because, uh, you know, David Crosby's 80 years old. How, how old is, uh, you know, pick any of you boomer acts. How old are the Stones? Uh, some of my favorite acts, someone like a Richard Thompson or a Southside Johnny or something. They have a limited ceiling now. They lost two years maybe more of touring, you, they're not going to get that back. The Who is another example of that. And for a lot of these acts, they have to be on the road. They can't just sit, sit in a little tomb and write. So we've lost those performances, most of which aren't going to be able to be made up, as opposed to someone like Machine Gun Kelly. All right, he'll, he'll TikTok for a year, and then he'll go back on the road. I'm not making fun of him. I'm just giving that as a point of reference. But I, I don't think – I haven't seen anyone write about it. This just may be me, but I don't think – any portion of the music industry has been as devastated by this as um, as the boomer industry for that reason this is time lost they will not get back these are records not made that will never be made and this is true of the audience as well well said dean johnson i always love talking music with you man always good talking with you as well be well Ruby, be safe bye now we'll talk, talk to you soon <laughs>